He's Derek. <laughs> She's Romaine. <laughs> this is Derek and Romaine. Derek. Hello, Romaine. Uh, it is uh, not Saturday, despite what Romaine thinks in her head. I did uh, it, in my mind say that today is Saturday, even though it's not. I don't know what day of the week it is, clearly. <laughs> We're so uh, frequently discombobulated around here, oh. uh, Derek and Romaine, but... Yeah. We're glad that you stick with us no matter what day of the week it is. Yes. Uh, we're always glad to have you with us. Uh, we're also glad uh, to have our guest, Darwin Del Fabro, who's going to be with us in a few minutes, a non-binary singer uh, with a terrific album out. And we are going to be talking to uh, him, uh, them, uh, in uh, just a few minutes. But uh, first, yes, before Derek. we get to our interview, mm-hmm. I... Uh, I want to talk about my latest uh, YouTube obsession. Oh, no. You're I, watching uh, YouTube? Okay. Uh, th- first of all, I think it's crazy that you are watching YouTube because you seem too old for it. But because YouTube is for the kids. Is it? Yeah. All oh, right. yeah. It's like Romy's generation. Uh, look, I, I, generation. I'm trying to convince Romaine that we need to do more YouTube content. Okay. Uh, to reach outside of our bubble. Yeah, all right. Uh, because, you know, I've been watching on YouTube, I've been watching uh, these uh, podcasts from The Bulwark uh, with uh, uh, JVL and his best friends, uh, Sarah Longwell, uh, noted lesbian, and uh, Tim Miller, noted homosexual man. And uh, yeah, JVL, I, I don't know his sexuality. I assume he's straight. I have no idea. But he apparently lives near me. Okay. I get the impression. I don't know how near me he lives, but I think he's in my general vicinity. Anyway, uh, I came in to the Bulwark podcast for Tim Miller because he's frequently on uh, the Stephanie Rules 11th Hour show with his little necklaces. And... Uh, and so I decided to check out his podcast finally. And then when I did, I absolutely fell in love with Sarah Longwell, uh, who um, is the publisher of The Bulwark. And she does a weekly podcast uh, called uh, The Focus Group. Not to be confused with our own focus group um, that we have as part of the DNR Studios Network with uh, John and Tim. Uh, but hers is actually about political focus groups where they interview voters and find out what their feelings are about their representatives or who's running for office or various issues and everything. Uh, And uh, it is very interesting because in the focus group podcast, they play audio clips from the focus groups. So you hear from actual voters what they think about. Oh, that's cool. And then she and another person uh, will, you know, they've listened, they've seen or listened to the entire focus group. And then they talk about sort of, uh, the takeaways from what voters felt about various things. And it's quite interesting. And uh, it's certainly, to me, it's better than sort of general punditry, you know, sure. like what I do. I- I'll give my opinion. And then my opinion is just my opinion, right? Yeah. I mean, I might, you know, have read a lot about something and I may have some idea, but the reality is I'm just expressing an opinion. Uh, but the nice thing about, a, uh, you know, focus groups with voters is you actually do hear from people who are actually voting and everything. So it isn't like a pundit thinks voters feel X, Y, and Z. It's we actually talk to 20 voters and this is what they they said to us. Mm. And, um, you know, you get a better, I think you get a better sense of, uh, voters and everything. Anyway, so I've become deeply into Sarah Longwell and uh, the whole f- um, uh, uh, Bulwark um, uh, podcast thing on YouTube. But because I have started watching, and usually I'll watch um, the show like before I go to bed. Okay. I'll watch a bit of uh, one That's of their That's some podcasts. heavy uh, bedtime viewing, but okay. You know what? I'm not, uh, I'm not sensitive uh, before I go to sleep. Okay. Now, uh, my uh, former roommate, Mike. Yes. He uh, he is more sensitive to, like, caffeine too late in the day. Right. Or uh, watching something that is too, like, gory or violent uh, right before bed. Yeah. 
Uh, and so he has to, he'll have to watch like a, if they, if he watches some kind of like dark movie earlier, he needs some kind of palate cleanser, like an episode mm. of, uh, the golden girls or Bob's burgers sure, sure, or sure. something like that. Parks and rec, uh, as a palate cleanser before he goes to sleep, I could, uh, watch whatever, um, a busload full of nuns burst into flames and then I'll like sleep tight. That's nice. So it and a follow like a pot of coffee while I'm watching it, and I'll be asleep in no time. So, I've actually find that coffee makes me sleepy. I drink not, coffee, and it makes me want to take a nap. Well, that's not really how it's supposed it's to work. It's not you supposed know. to work like that, but that's what it does to me. So anyway, I understand. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, for me, yeah, uh, I uh, will watch a little something uh, you, like before I go to bed, and so I'll watch some of this, and sometimes uh, they. Uh, their podcast, not the not the um, focus group podcast, but their general podcast, the Bulwark podcast with mm-hmm. the three of them. Uh, sometimes I'll watch, you know, 20 minutes and I'll find myself nodding off because it's usually like an hour. And so I'll watch 20 minutes and I'll fall asleep. And then the next day I'll come back for another 20 minutes with the uh, with a focus group podcast. I watch that on the main TV, like as part of my once a week evening TV viewing. Okay. And I watch the whole thing and I am wide awake. Uh, but anyway, I like their dynamic between the three of them, and it's fun. I think it's what people, the reaction I have to the Bulwark, the three of them and their podcast, I think is the reaction that our listeners have, have to, to us. us. Okay. I'm like, oh, I just love listening to them talking, even if I don't really feel like the needle has moved in I learned or I grew or I was informed. I enjoy our time together. So that's how I that's how I feel about them. Anyway, but that's not what I wanted to talk about um, in terms of what my YouTube obsession has become. But as you know, when you watch YouTube, the yes. algorithm starts feeding you other content that you might be interested in based on some of the other things that you've watched. Right. And I will watch uh, my main things that I watch on YouTube these days are obviously the bulwark things. Um, I will watch, uh, Harry, uh, uh, Anton, uh, he has a, a podcast, uh, called Talking Feds. I'll watch a bit of that cause he's a, a lawyer and he gives analysis of, you know, legal things that are going on. So I'll watch a bit of that. Uh, but he's dry. He often puts me a little bit to sleep too, but I feel more informed by him anyway. So I'll watch that. And then I watch, uh, behind the scenes, uh, interviews, things with celebrities about, uh, things I'm interested in. Once I started rewatching Moonlighting, I went down a absolute K hole of watching uh, interviews and behind the scenes thing on uh, everything that went down on Moonlighting, which in some ways was more interesting than the last season of the show. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, the '80s TV ladies, uh, you know, recently interviewed uh, Glenn Gordon, Karen, the creator of the show, and there were a lot of problems behind the scenes on that show. Mm-hmm. Like pl- plenty of blame yeah. to go around. But anyway, so I have gotten into that. And, you know, during Oscar season, I'll watch some of the behind the scenes stuff about actors talking about some of the movies that uh, came up before the Oscars. Anyway, uh, but uh, I uh, watched <laughs> I watched uh, YouTube tours of of tiny prefab houses. Because, you know, I had I had started to get into the city nerd where he talks about uh, sort of urban areas that are sort of the best cities. It's like uh, like uh, the kinds of cities you wouldn't necessarily think of to live in. Right. Of what's uh, what's great about various cities, because, you know, I think all the time, you know, you're planning on moving to Nashville. And I am also thinking about, you know, my third act around here. I mean, given how many acts I've had, it's probably like our my tenth act. But anyway, uh, but you know, I'm I'm here for a long while. But right. I am expecting. You know, what will I do after this? I mean, will sure. I just stay here forever, or Maybe. will I do something else? Nah. So I have thought about like, well, is there another place I might be interested in living, like another city, uh, another just area of the country to live in? Right. And and uh, so I started watching the city nerd thing. And it's interesting. Basically, all of the best places to move to that are not the big cities you've heard of are some kind of college town. Well, that makes sense. Well, just that they have, they tend to be more walkable. They have better public transportation. 
and they're smaller. So if you can get a lot more bang for your buck uh, living in, say, a college town in Iowa or a college town in Ohio uh, than you can living in Chicago or New York or San Francisco or L.A., right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but most small to medium-sized cities don't have robust um, public transportation, but these college towns tend to because, you know, the, uh, not every college student has a car. Right. And they need to get around. And frequently the universities or colleges are uh, participating in the available public transportation. Either one of the cities, they have student drivers that drive the buses, which may or may not fill you with confidence. Yeah, it does not fill me with confidence. <laughs> I mean, I know you've been working with pie pants learning to drive. So just like think about pie pants in four years driving yeah, a city bus. Yeah, no thanks. That's terrifying. <laughs> A little bit, but, you know, I take my life in my hands every day I'm on the stairs. So, yeah. you know, is it really that different? Anyway, so I got into that, and then it started serving me uh, prefab tiny houses. And so I've gotten into some of the tours of prefab tiny houses on YouTube. I know. So but- is there, I should ask you, uh, is there a particular kind of tiny house that is by far the best designed? That you've seen, like the A-frame styles, or like what? What so far of all the tiny houses you've watched, which one do you like the best? Well, here's the real problem: is that uh, with this kind of prefab tiny house thing, is there's kind of a twofold problem. One, uh, actually, it's the same problem. Kind of the best of these kinds of houses are not anywhere near where I currently live or even where I might consider mm. living. Because, you know, sometimes I think, well, in the future, when I sell my house, uh, you know, when I have, like, money, right. you know, then, like, to buy something else or live somewhere else, right? Yeah. So this is the plan. It's like, well, I will downsize because I already don't need all the space I have, but I am kind of sitting on a money bomb of, you know, at some point I will be able to sell this house for more than I paid for it. And mm-hmm. then, uh, plus I've been paying off the mortgage and everything over time. So I will have all of this free cash to spend on something. And from a tax standpoint, I'll want to pour it into, uh, something, uh, probably like a smaller condo or a smaller house, uh, somewhere. And one of the things I have been thinking about is like, well, maybe what if I bought like a piece of land and put a tiny house on it? You know, I don't need a lot of space. Right. uh, But I also don't like being around people. So I could be like a crazy person who kind of lives a a, a little in the woods. Yeah. Uh, But then I think, oh, I could have a little tiny house and then I could also have like an RV. So I could be on a piece of land that's in kind of a cold weather place. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then in the wintertime, I could hop in my RV and run away. Spend it somewhere else. Right. Or drive around, see my friends. Spend time in warmer climates, see the country. I enjoy seeing America. I like to travel. I like to. I like the open road. I don't necessarily love driving necessarily, but I do love our national park system and seeing other parts of the country. I'm I'm really into that. Sure. And again, I don't need a lot of space, and so it doesn't have to be a huge, glamorous motorhome with six, you know, bump outs or anything. But anyway. So Why do you uh, need six bump outs? Doesn't no. everybody need six bump outs? I just like that word bump out. Yeah, I know you do. That's fun. Bump out with a trump out. Yeah. But no. Okay. Uh, you just need what? The one bump out? I actually may may not even need that. What? I really don't need a lot of space. Uh, but uh, anyway, so, uh, but these tiny houses that they have, these prefab tiny houses, there are lots of companies that are making really interesting uh, smaller homes, and they have some different strategies. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them that I watched, they have basically a uh, like a temporary pop up prefab factory that they right. can put on site, where they basically can move their operations to a location and then build a series of you know small prefab houses like right there. Right. Others of them basically flap. Flat ship like yeah. IKEA, yep. all and then the pieces, they put them all together, and then you put it all uh, together yeah. there. Uh, there are a lot of different strategies, and then some of them are small enough uh, to fit on the back of a truck, and then yes. that could be driven wherever. So different companies have different strategies. Um, they're all trying to sort of uh, not look 
like an old school mobile home. Uh huh. And uh, you know, and so I like some of the uh, design stuff, although they tend to all look very similar <laughs> in the end. Like they don't look like an old school uh mobile home, but they then look like they all look the same as right. a new mobile home. So it's not really. Uh, you know, you've changed it, but it just became something else. But uh, they have gotten more sophisticated and uh, better, more environmentally friendly. A lot of them sort of come with built-in solar panels and that kind of thing. And I would want something that was a bit, uh, not off the grid, but a little self-sufficient. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, So anyway, so I uh, got into that, and then that started serving me tours of RVs. And then I have really gotten into... Like uh, staring at RVs. <laughs> oh, honey, what are we going to do with you? I mean, I, is there something you're supposed to do with me? I mean, no, I just think uh, I'm a little I you're going to end up in a you're going to end up in an RV. This is your dream. You've always dreamed about having an RV. I do. Like in all of the time I've known you, which is an awful long time. I know for a fact you have talked about owning an RV over and over and over and over and over again. I think maybe it's time you just, I don't know, own an RV. I think in a past life I was a snail. Oh, is that why you want an RV? You want to take crab. your home everywhere with you? I think I've always, like, yeah, I just take my home with me. And by the way, I'm not the That's only one. You know, my mother, Yeah. Uh, she, uh, in her past, lived in her uh, VW, like, van camper mm-hmm. uh when we weren't around we were little kids to save money because my mom didn't have any money uh when we were gone at my dad's house for six months out of the year my mom would like live in a camper van for six months and then get a new place to live with bedrooms for us when we came back that's really part smart of, yeah it was but you know she was young and she had a big dog and uh you know it was fine like right. for her she didn't need a lot uh, and she had a lot of friends locally, so it wasn't like, oh, I never, I'm never in a house, I'm never whatever. But it was really convenient um, for her and easy. Mm-hmm. And she's like me, real. I don't need a lot in order to like live on a day to day basis. Right. Uh, so you know, some of her bigger furniture she would you know store in somebody's garage for a few months, and then you know the rest of it would be in the car with her. And then when we came back. Uh, we would live somewhere else. <laughs> hmm. Like, just how it was for a bit of our childhood. My mom was in her 20s. You know, that wasn't so hard for her. Right. And, um, you know, and sometimes my mom talks about doing that again. And I think, well, you know, you know, it it might be harder to live in a van uh, in your 70s than in your 20s. But then I think about that for myself. I'm like, oh, how about how much work do I want to put into this? So. Anyway, so I look at these RVs, but I do, I think I would enjoy it, uh, be bopping around. But my hope is by the time I get to the place where I'm doing this, they will be autonomous or semi-autonomous. Right. And so I won't have to do nearly as much driving. Um, or it'll, it'll be do, just It'll easier. do the driving for you. Yeah. But more to the, but more to the point. I now can't with, imagine you driving an RV, by the way. Uh, it's a terrifying else? concept. It's not that terrifying. Uh, it is. I've driven, uh, you know, large uh, U-Haul mm-hmm. vehicles before, mm-hmm. and uh, a, a houseboat. You can be a somewhat terrifying driver. Well, that's something that will only get better with time. Yeah, exactly. And then the idea of you driving a giant vehicle—it's uh, a little scary. Well, this little is scary. why. I- this is why I'm ready for this autonomous vehicle thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, to yeah. Take no, place. I know. Uh, but you know, there's uh, the fuel efficiency has gotten better over time with these things, and uh, the internet, like the connectivity. So you're really not completely off the grid uh, with these things. Uh, and it just like all of the technology around RVs has dramatically improved. So you really can have kind of a sweet life on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, without a lot of suffering, because you know how I hate to suffer. Oh, we do. Uh, in this kind of thing. So I am uh, watching along, but I think I would go with one of the, like a smaller, like an under 25 foot, you know, the kind of like uh, camper RVs that have mm-hmm. the the bed over the front cab. Yeah. You know, like that. 
Uh, and I, you know, it's going to be just me. So I don't need a ton of space. That's all the space I would need. I think uh, one of these van conversions would be too small for me, like to actually live in. But they do, you know, but it, it would be easier to drive. Probably true. But then, of course, in my head, what I want is one of those, like, gigantic, you know, the the superstar motor coaches, you know, the, with three bedrooms and two stories and nine yeah. pop-outs. And, oh, yeah, yeah, in my In my head, that's what I want. But that's insane. And, again, I would end up in a vehicle that is more, just like the house I'm in now, more than I could ever possibly need. Yeah. And it seems silly, especially if it's really just a a few months out of the year, I'm going to drive around in it and then come back and I have a, like a, a real place to actually live and call home. Then I don't need a ton of space because if I start feeling claustrophobic or too disconnected, I just drive home. Well, that's true. And that would work out pretty well for you, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I support your RV dreams, Derek. Thank you, Romaine. I appreciate you supporting yeah, my dreams. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's what I'm here for, honestly. <laughs> I try Bes- to do what besides, I can. Besides, you'll be on some kind of farm yeah. in uh in Tennessee. Yes. Uh raising, I'm going to assume a herd of cats. Uh sure. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think that that could be accurate. That could be accurate. Yeah. Now the one uh the one concern I have about these RVs, uh, and maybe this is something that will change in the future as they like get better solar panels on them or they're more electrified, they may p- have it be a lot more like electric or all electric. Because right. right now they have uh they utilize a lot of propane for like the water heater, for the yeah, hot yeah, water, yeah. for the they stove. Do. They do. And propane's not cheap. Well, no, it's not really about that, but apparently, um, you know, they did a study on gas stoves because, you know, there's. Oh, yeah. Uh, and how they basically emit uh, carbon monoxide into your house. Yeah. Uh, apparently, it isn't just the carbon monoxide. Uh, they emit as much benzene in your house uh, as you would get if you lived with a smoker. Ooh. It's essentially like living like secondhand smoke. Right. When you have a, a gas stove in your house. And I would imagine uh, most of the time in an RV, you're going to have the windows open yeah. while you're in the RV. Because you're in a country area, you're going to want the fresh air. So I'm sure that the air circulation inside an RV is better than it would be. But even still, if you're using that gas stove inside the RV... It's basically like somebody lighting up a cigarette inside right. the RV while you're in it. So, uh, you know, but if I'm already, like, let's say, re- retiree age in the 70 range, uh, you know, I won't have as many shopping days left before Christmas anyway. Like, what what will really be the harm of being in that kind of an environment at that point? Right. Uh, because the the time it would take for those effects to be... Uh, bad for me would be, you know, whatever. It would take a while. But even still, you know, there's no reason to put yourself in harm's way. So I'm hopeful that among the developments that might happen in the RV world is that they will eventually shy away. Uh, but I would imagine that the reason that they they have this is that, you know, you don't want to get into a situation where you have limited battery power. Right. And you have to choose between... Uh, leaving where you are or cooking dinner or taking a shower, you know, if everything is all electric and you just have your battery, if your battery dies, you are real fucked. Yeah. There's no backup anything for anything. That's true. Uh, and at least with the propane, like you could have like a, like a backup uh, generator with you where you could generate some power. <laughs> like if your phone is dying, you could call for help you know, there is some value in having a gas powered engine that can recharge your batteries for the, right. on the electric side of things as you're driving and whatever else, or run your electricity off of the gas engine. Um, though I understand why they have this. Uh, and certainly I think it's part of what has continued to, uh, be a weight on the EV, uh, push mm-hmm. that people just have a lot of anxiety of, putting all their eggs in one basket that right. they don't have around gas because there's always more gas somewhere. 
That's true. That's but true. I do, but I do worry about the like air quality situation. Uh, yeah, I can see how that would be a concern, I suppose. But I, I agree. I think that uh, with the rechargeable, with like the generators and the vehicles and everything, that might take away some of those concerns. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, I, you know, I think that they uh, hopefully they will make like more efficient, lighter batteries because that's the real push right now. Right. The, the the EVs, the batteries that are in them make the vehicles heavier. Right. And, you know, some of the conservatives who don't like electric vehicles and the push to save the environment are like, well, uh, the EVs are putting out uh, as much um, uh, pollutants into the air uh, as a gas vehicle because the wear on the tires is more on a heavier vehicle. And therefore, having these small EVs, uh, they're basically ed- as emitting um, more particles into the into the same amount of particles in the air as a fuel efficient gas powered tiny vehicle is doing because of the wear and tear tread on tires. Now, right. you know, I didn't notice conservatives being concerned about the wear and tear on tr- tires into the air of those gigantic tank Hummers that everyone was obsessed with 20 years ago. Mm. I feel like, you know, conservatives are only concerned about emissions from airplanes when it's Taylor Swift's plane. You know what I'm saying? Or yes. Al Gore's. I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, I, it, this is an ongoing concern within the industry because, you know, you could make an all electric RV, but it's going to weigh 20,000 pounds. <laughs> like it's going to be so fucking heavy. Right. Because of the batteries that you would need to drive it around. Yeah. That would be a lot of batteries. Cause it's already a physically weighty thing. Cause yeah. you're packing a lot into it with uh, your water tank on top of all of these other, things. like oh, a RV about the water tank. Yeah. Yeah. An RV weighs a lot. And the bigger the RV, the bigger their water tank is. Right. And uh, unlike a gas tank where the longer you go, your gas tank is emptying. So it's getting lighter over time with the water tank. <laughs> the water just goes into a gray tank. And yeah. so it just transfers. It's not. Yeah, it never leaving. really gets lighter. Yeah. Yeah. Solid point. Right. So they have to make the batteries lighter in order to make this, uh, you know, a, a better option. Yeah. Uh, over time. And so I keep thinking, well, the technology is going to continue to make this an improved uh, situation. Right. Hopefully. (laughs) Yes, hopefully. Oh, Lord. But would you ever live in an RV? or uh, Have you ever Um, actually been on an RV vacation? Have you gone in an RV and driven around? uh, I, okay. I have stayed in an RV before, but not for a very, 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 not as an adult. As a child, uh, I do remember that my parents... We stayed in an RV, like a friend's RV, up in the mountains. Um, but it, I didn't like it very much. Because I remember, like, the bathroom is teeny tiny. Like, the, the it's like it's it's like that horrible um, NCL ship that has the horrible bathroom where you're, like, in a coffin, and that's where your bathroom's at. It's like the teeny tiny little space. I hated that about the RV experience. Um, I didn't. I And I'm, like... The whole having to, like, fold things down and pick things up so you'd have a place to sit or lay down or, like, all that kind of crap. I hated all that. I hated it. Um, RV life is not for me, I think is what I'm saying. I think it would be fun if someone was driving and I was doing something, like, while we're traveling from place to place, if I could, like, sit at a table and play games or work on my computer or something. Like, in that respect, I think I would like RVing. But in the um, living in a small, teeny tiny space, no. What would you have done if your rock star dream had come true? You would have been in an RV all the time. Yeah, I know. I but I wouldn't have been driving it, and I don't know that I would have loved sleeping in it. I would. I guess I would have made do. But like, when you look at like the tour buses for for people, like Dolly Parton's tour bus. Like, when you look where some of her friends had to sleep, they basically were sleeping in coffins. You can't even sit up in your bed. Like, you lie in your bed like a coffin, and then then a foot and a half above you is another bed. I would hate it. I would hate everything about that experience. I'd hate it. I couldn't sleep in a coffin is what I'm saying. 
Because that's what it looks like and feels like to me. If very claustrophobic, I wouldn't like it. Now, tiny house living, I think I could do tiny house. But it's funny because, you know, I've been, I've been looking at tiny houses um, for Romy and thinking about what we're going to build for her when we move to Nashville. And the biggest problem I have with tiny houses are the kitchens. Like, I could live in a tiny house if it had a full kitchen. Like, and a full kitchen means it has to have an oven and it has to have a full size or even an apartment size refrigerator. And it's like a stovetop, like an oven, stovetop, apartment size refrigerator, and preferably a small dishwasher. If it didn't have those things, I couldn't live there. There are some things that I have to have. And it has to have a real working toilet. It can't be like one of these composting toilets. I'm not interested in that. See, this is why I can't live like this. (laughs) You have a lot of requirements. I do have a lot of requirements. Like, it has to be just the basic necessities. It has to have the basic necessities, yes. And, you know. I mean, I'm with you on that because some of these, uh, like the RVs. Yeah. I, they're like, oh, and ha- look at this big oven. And like, who cares? As long as there's a microwave. What am I? Am I roasting a chicken in this thing? Am I making Thanksgiving dinner? No, you know, but I, sometimes you need to be able to bake things. You can't yes. bake things in a fucking microwave. True. Now, if you have like an air fryer type of mechanism, like a large air fryer, like a convection oven air fryer that is not a full oven, I would. you can get away with that. But... I got to have something, some way of baking things. Yeah. I just think that they're, uh, you know, the whole oven thing. I'm just like, mm, I don't know how much oven I need. Yeah. Yes. You need some oven, but I, be a I big think, oven. Just I think oven. if I'm in an RV, I'm not spending a lot of time cooking <laughs> like, oh, let me make a three course meal here. But I do care about how big the fridge is and freezer because I want. I want to pack a lot of shit in there. Right. That's what I care about. Yes. All right. Fair well, enough. Well, we, pa- we pack a lot of shit into every show here. And uh, coming up next, uh, we've got even more fun to come uh, with our interview that's coming up next here on Derek and Romaine. Stay tuned for more Derek and Romaine. Uh, Derek here along with Romaine. And joining us now by phone, it is uh, singer and actor Darwin Del Fabro. Uh, you can check out Darwin uh, on the web at darwindelfabro.com. And uh, they are also uh, Darwin Del Fabro on Instagram and Darwin Del Fabro and the number one on Twitter. Uh, Darwin, so nice to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's so nice to talk to you. Absolutely. Uh, now, you are a, a singer and actor, and uh, you are non-binary, and you use the pronouns he, they, correct? Yes, correct. Yes, okay, correct. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, so what has the experience been like for you uh, as a non-binary performer? How, uh, what opportunities or disadvantages have there been uh, for you in your experience? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the opportunity is where I where I think about my happiness and uh, be free to explore uh, whatever I want with my art. And I think being non-binary gave me um, much more room for that. The advantages is just like we're still in the in a world that it's 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 very problematic about people who have the strength to to be themselves. Um, and that sometimes um, can be a little intimidated. So um, yeah, there are two points, but I always like to think about what makes me happy and be surrounded by people that um, will appreciate and admire what I have to offer as an artist. Now, Darwood, you grew up in Brazil and uh, Brazil is not, exactly known for being super uh kind or supportive to lgbtq folks so what was that like knowing that you were uh you know different and and not uh heterosexual normative uh you know you have this uh, gender identity that is definitely different from everybody else so i mean was that a struggle growing up or did you always just say hey this is who i am i'm gonna be who i am no matter what it's always a challenge. Uh, I don't like to generalize and talk about Brazil as like a, 
a bad place. But sure. yes, unfortunately, it is the country who most kill LGBT people in the entire world. Wow. Um, and I, I live in Manhattan, which, which, it, which it is a bubble. Uh, I know that if I go out of, of Manhattan, we have similarities of what I, my experience in some places in Brazil. So um, it's it's challenge, yes, but I think I always had the support of my family, and they were always they always gave me the freedom to express myself, and and I'm always worried about mentally mentally my health uh, mentally, and 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 just just something that um, I was never a person who was hiding something. Uh, mm-hmm. And yes, sometimes you have the challenges of not hiding and the exposure of of being a a non-binary person, a person who, you know, has a little more of like a feminine look, uh, wear dresses and high heels and not ashamed of that. Um, But I think we we need to put that image out there and we need to show the power of, of who we are and the freedom that we kind of want to have in our lives. So... Uh, if it's not there yet, um, I think it's one of my missions to uh, put myself there and, and bring art with what I have. So did you always kind of know you were non-binary growing up before you came to the U.S., or was it something that you really started to embrace once you got to the United States? I think it's a process, you know, just like we, we're um, we're talking about genders and understanding more the language towards like the recent years. And I you know when I was in Brazil, like eight years ago, I, I use only he pronouns. I was queer. I, I was always open about it, but, but the, the transition happened once I moved to New York and I, I felt that I started to explore a little more and to have more freedom and, and feel a little more safe in a certain way to to find those those elements. Uh, but I was I was always queer, you know, <laughs> we're born queer and <laughs> uh, I, I, I I struggle with kind of some of the the prejudice of of of, of being different. Um, yeah. which happens here too. It's just like uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do uh, in, in that perspective. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, you uh, recently uh, uh, did star uh, in a uh, movie, uh, They, Them, uh, which is an LGBTQ uh, slasher film. Um, and uh, so uh, what? Uh, how, how did that opportunity come about? And I know there are a lot of LGBTQ people who worked on the film, you know, uh, in front of the camera and, and behind the scenes. So how was that experience for you? It's magical. I'm just like, I'm a, a huge horror fan. And to do my first feature in America, where our protagonist is non-binary, in one of the genres that I most like, is just, it's so important. I think um, we're going to look back 10 years from now, and we're going to understand the importance of what that movie represents to, to the moment that we are living. Um, I hope we, we, we have more opportunities and chances to, to explore more and put rare people as the center of, 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 of our work of art and movies and theater and music, so, which was, was magical. And uh, Joan Logan, who directed the, and he, he did his first directorial debut with, with They Slash Them, uh, but he is, you know, uh, an important writer. He really was open to got the essence and the uniqueness of each of the actors who were in this movie. So that was really inspired and and magical as a Brazilian, Latino, queer, and non-binary <laughs> actor and singer building uh, an international career. And you got to start with uh, Kevin Bacon and Carrie Preston, which in and of itself is pretty damn cool. Yes, they're they're awesome. And Kevin Kevin loves music. He he does know. He used to do more uh, his Fridays with Kevin, where he uh, plays a lot of jazz and always uh, he's always presenting a new person and uh, a new singer. So he's really passionate. Uh, 
he's very passionate for music and and that's that's very cool carrie it's just like she lives in new york too anna shlansky it's just like theo germain you know it's just like this cast was we we shot this uh in the pandemic so we had to stay in the same hotel it, it was just so so amazing to, we, we became a family literally because we couldn't go out we you know we stayed together the whole time and and it's really nice when you put a lot of people who kind of understand each other um so it was really easy it was just like a vacation that I was being paid for <laughs> <laughs> That sounds amazing. <laughs> you need to hang out with incredibly talented people, people who love music, making art, you know, making this incredible fun uh, film. I mean, that, boy, your life is hard, uh, Darwin. Yeah, um, my life is hard. No, my life is hard, okay, but uh, but I work harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, people can check out uh, They Slash Them. Uh, it is streaming now on uh, Peacock. And uh, speaking of music, you are are also a singer as well as an actor. Uh, so uh, you started singing quite young, right? Yes, when I was three. It's crazy. I, I won my first competition, my singing competition, when I was three, and since then I, I'm still here singing. Which do you prefer, singing or acting? Well, I started singing, but uh, my kind of singing and the singer that I believe uh I am and I want to be and I'm always searching for it's uh, a storyteller singer. Right. Uh, so it's all mixed. I just like, I don't believe a song without a meaning and I don't believe uh, bringing a song to myself without really um, identifying with what the words of that song mean. Um, so I think just the, the singing helps in, in my acting career and, and, and my acting helps in my singing because at the end of the day, it's just a, a unique melody for all. Sure. So let's talk about your new album. Uh, it is called Ooh. Revisiting Ellis Regina. And for people who don't... Great pronunciation. Say... Sorry to interrupt you. Great pronunciation. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, for people who don't know, who is uh, Ellis Regina? Alice Regina is the is the voice of Brazil, in my opinion. It was my favorite singer, still is my favorite singer of all time. Um, I compare her to Billie Holiday, Piaf, the big ones. Okay. Um, she was a, a big voice uh, in the '60s in the in the dictatorship of Brazil and a very um, challenged moment, and she was always representing the strength of, of being free and have the freedom as an artist and as a woman. So, so a lot of the same things just, you believe in. Exactly. So when I, uh, I haven't been to Brazil, uh, I moved to New York to do my international career and I, uh, I, I travel now recently to Brazil for four months just to record this album. So when I was thinking about, you know, uh, Presenting myself as a non-binary, using he, they pronouns, and knowing the challenges. Nothing better than to take my favorite singer of all time, the best composers of all time, and and bring it to my version of 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 the voice that I want to to bring to the world in 2024. But that was the challenge and something that I'm, I'm very happy with the results. So you you took some of her classic uh, songs and you changed them a little bit. Yes, yes, I changed. You know, it's, that that was recorded in the 60s, 70s, and um, even though it's just so modern, the lyrics itself, uh, because I'm non-binary and I, I use he they and just like i don't mind using the she as well right um i play in and putting in the same in the same song both of the pronouns um there's the song that i think we're going to play today called como nosso spies that a, a literally translation is like our fathers that the end of the song she used to sing we are the same and like our parents and i changed it to we are not as same as our parents, because I think we we need to change. We need to improve the views of the world. And um, old generations sometimes got a little used to what 
how and the way they were raised. And right. things are changing so fast right now that we need to keep the pace if we want, if we want to have a, a better place to live. And I believe that even though I have wonderful parents and they were very open with everything, I know the generations and I think we we just need to 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 build a little faster the the pace of the changes and um yeah um I don't know if I answer your question but <laughs> well I I mean I will say sometimes it's unsettling how much like our parents we are but uh also you know you have to be true to yourself you have to express uh who you are as a as a person not just as a a uh, reflection of your parents or a reflection of their hopes and dreams. I, I think that's what happens to a lot of people is they get they get caught up in their parents' dreams. Uh, you know, sometimes yeah. parents have unfulfilled dreams and then they project those onto their children. Uh, but I think at the core, you know, as long as you're being true to yourself, uh, that's uh, ultimately what matters. My parents gave me all the love that I could experience and I share in the entire world, and that's very important. But as my name says, Darwin, I believe in evolution. So how can I take all of those good things and and make those things get uh, bigger and and share it even more with the world? Um, I think that's just like something that I always trying to do as as a human being, just like being uh, even more open and just sharing uh, the good things that I experience in this life. Uh, and uh, both of your parents uh, were models, and I know that yes. uh, beauty culture is big in uh, South America and especially in Brazil. So, uh, what are your what are your <laughs> feelings about that uh, 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 broadly, and also sort of having that be part of your uh, family legacy? In Brazil, what do you mean to the beauty culture in Brazil? In the whole world, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is not? Just <laughs> in Brazil, it's not of, no, it's in the whole world. But uh, yes, we 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 use our speedos and we go to the beach. And yes, there is, especially in Rio de Janeiro, uh, a little of a, a choice of the body and, body and importance. And I think, and I'm sorry for all the listeners, like uh, Brazilians are the most beautiful people in the oh, entire world. And uh, it's just uh, not only aesthetically, but also just like their hearts and their souls. And I just like, anyway, um, I I think my family, uh, they were... They were that in that world, but they always have a character behind uh, that beauty. So, and they always had a message. So they they were very smart of how to use uh, all of that together. And I think when you think smartly about all of those elements, which uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, it's still important in the world. Uh, as a non-binary, I, I really just like my message is just like you could never judge a person by the way that person looks because, uh, you know, you can never think I am she or I am he. You need to ask that. That's why I, 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 my message is like that. Um, as same as, for example, I, I think you can never judge a person by their status, by their color. Um, so it's just... Um, it's it's it, the tricky question because yeah they came to that world but I, I they were never eaten by that world so you always uh, bring in a message that will be useful to to help the world in general with their careers um, and then they transitioned to acting and directing and you know did some social work so it's just it's just knowing how to to use your voice and um yeah in in the best way as possible i want to ask you about the theater because i know you're very passionate about theater you want to perform more in theater uh and as i mm -hmm. understand it you're working on a production now yes Yes, yes, yes. Um, I created a play in Brazil uh, when I was like 13. And uh, when I came to New York, I asked John Logan, who directed the movie, they asked them to adapt it. 
And um, so I'm starting and directing for the first time in America because I have been directing in Brazil uh, a few things, but now is the first time that I will be directing here in America. We we are opening on June 28th and um, off Broadway um, theater uh, in Midtown. And what is this production called? It's called Lily. Lily. Yes. Oh, how interesting. And you wrote it when you were 13? Yes, yes. We started in the process of it when I was 13 and then 14. And then, uh, yes, we did just like a, a, a workshop kind of a presentation of that in Brazil. And then I moved to America. So uh, it's just like a, a beautiful play that I always want to revisit. And I think now is the time for it. Now, Darwin, you've started so young in your career here with singing at three, uh, writing <laughs> at 13, 14. Here's an important question for you. Have I wasted my life? Yes. <laughs> never. We never waste our lives. Are you kidding? Just, uh, just to be able to share the things with me, I'm just like, I'm just so honored to be here. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, here's what here's what I find interesting. So I love young people. I think young people have a lot of interesting points of view and a lot of interesting things She's to say. She's extracting their blood to live forever. Shut up, I'm not. <laughs> but I have always felt this way, especially about young queer people. And yet, uh, older queer people tend to ignore okay. young gay people and don't think they have anything to say. So I find it fascinating that at 13, you started... Uh, writing this play and now uh you know you're older and uh you know you're putting this play on but it's the perspective of a 13 year old (laughs) like i think that's amazing that you know that you held on to this this uh this piece of work because you knew it was important and you knew it was something you really wanted to express at some point in your life uh but it is the thoughts and feelings of a 13 year old yeah i think it's just what Oh, yes, it's it's so tricky because we're always involving in a certain way. Right. I don't know if the, the place they will be a 13-year-old uh, point of view because I've changed so much since the time. It's, it's the same thing as when I recorded this album now, and it's been so important for me because I wanted to go back to Brazil because I said that this album, even though, yes, let's, let's tell the truth. I want people to experience uh, and enjoy the album. This album was for myself. It was mm-hmm. a child that I left um, there in Brazil, and I wanted to uh, come back and embrace and tell uh, him, look, just like, just hold on, and you're in the right track. It's going to be difficult, but um, you you just need to believe in yourself. And I, my album, in a certain way, was was embrace and just a, a little to all those experiences that I have in my childhood. That's why it was just so powerful for me to record it and so difficult to to deal with songs that I have been missing since I was four. And only now with my age, I'm, uh, I'm able to, to deliver it in a way that I really understand them. So I think the play is also, it's got, yes, with grade and with 13, but maybe uh, now... I will finally understand what what was behind those mm-hmm. things, if you know what I mean. I do. I think a lot. I think a lot of queer people experience that. I think there are. I mean, I know if I could go back and talk to my teenage self, there are so many things I would want to tell her about the future mm. and what it holds because it, you know my teenage self was bullied a lot and treated pretty horribly. And, you know, those things ultimately made me the person that I am today and made me uh, as strong as I am today to endure some of the things I've dealt with. But I, I, I definitely, uh, I understand the wanting to revisit that person that you once were uh, with the knowledge of today. Yeah, because we're learning with that, even with the, the bullying and all of those things, which were horrible. And I, I'm, I'm very happy that I have the support of my family and I never, uh, I was always, I always trust them and I was always able to tell them everything mm-hmm. that helped me a lot to protect myself from the world. I think, um, yeah, as I suffered from bullying, uh, but those things also helped me to, to realize even more who I am and the strength that no one's going to dictate my future and, uh, 
Yes, it's all always learning. I, I'm always trying to see like the positive way of, about everything because um, that's that's the person that I want to be. And um, yeah, so we're we're in the right path. It's just um, I, I I just ask people to, and especially parents to you know don't let your your children uh, hide things from you. Uh, right. Be you know share with them and. It, it's tricky because uh, again we're talking about generations, but if we open the conversations, I think it's much healthier than uh, each one goes to a place and we, we, we you know we split in different communities and and then we never had the contact with Chavez to learn about others' experience. Right. That's right. Uh, well, Darwin, I appreciate you sharing your experience with us uh, and with everyone uh, through I your. Too much, right? uh, yeah, you're work. great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, it was, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, and uh, you can check out uh, Darwin Del Fabro uh, on the web at darwindelfabro.com. You can check out uh, his uh, new album there, uh, uh, Revisiting Ellis Regina. And uh, you can check out uh, his movie, They Slash Them, uh, which is uh, streaming now on Peacock. And of course, uh, be sure to uh, like and follow Darwin in social media. Darwin Del Fabro on Instagram and Darwin Del Fabro, the number one, uh, on Twitter. Here is uh, one of the songs uh, from Revisiting Ellis Regina here on Derek and Romain. Take a listen. Não quero lhe falar, meu grande amor. Das coisas que aprendi nos discos Quero lhe contar como eu vivi E tudo que aconteceu comigo Viver é melhor que sonhar Eu sei que o amor é uma coisa boa Mas também sei que qualquer canto é menor do que a vida de qualquer pessoa Por isso, coitado meu bem Há perigo na esquina Eles venceram E o sinal está fechado para nós Que somos jovens Para abraçar seu irmão e beijar o seu menino na rua É que se fez o meu braço O meu lábio e a minha voz Você me pergunta pela minha paixão Digo que estou encantado com uma nova invenção Eu vou ficar nessa cidade Não vou voltar pro sertão Pois vejo vivendo no vento O cheiro da nova estação Eu sei de tudo na ferida viva Do meu coração Já faz tempo eu vi você na rua Cabelo ao vento, gente jovem reunida na parede da memória Essa lembrança É o quadro que dói mais Minha dor é perceber Que apesar de termos feito tudo Tudo, tudo o que fizemos Ainda somos os mesmos E vivemos Ainda somos os mesmos e vivemos como os nossos pais Nossos ídolos ainda são os mesmos E as aparências não enganam, não Você diz que depois dela Não apareceu mais ninguém Você pode até dizer eu tô por fora Ou então Que eu tô inventando Mas é você Que é no passado e que não vê É você Que é no 
passado que não vê Que o novo sempre vem Hoje eu sei que quem me deu a ideia De uma nova consciência e juventude Tá em casa, guardado por Deus Contando o vil metal Minha dor é perceber Que apesar de termos feito tudo Tudo, tudo que fizemos Ainda somos os mesmos e vivemos Nós não somos os mesmos nem vivemos Nós não somos os mesmos nem viveremos como os nossos Well, there you have it. The end of another perfect episode of Derek and Romaine. And if you want more great fun, go to dnrstudios.com and subscribe to get our show every day. And don't forget, for DNR Plus subscribers, you can use the DNR Cast app for iPhone, available now in the App Store.